Hey, mental workers, you're listening to the Mental Work Podcast, your companion to early career psychology, sponsored by the Australian Association of Psychologists. And I'm your host, Dr. Bruno Milkins, and today we are talking about what is a professional association and what should it do for you? Here to help us unpack all of that and how it's relevant to you are two guests, and one of them is Carly Dober. Hi, Carly. Hi. And the other one is Sarah O'Doherty. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Thank you so much. Both have been guests on the podcast individually, and it's such a pleasure to have you back on together. Very excited to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Excellent. And could I please ask you both to introduce yourselves and what your non-psychology passion is? Maybe we'll start with Carly. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carly, a psychologist and a director at the Australian Association of Psychologists. I have so many passions outside psychology, but probably my main ones are hiking and surfing. Amazing. And Sarah? So I am Sarah O'Doherty. I am a psychologist at uh, Mindscape Psychology in Sydney's Inner West. I'm also the current president of the Australian Association of Psychologists. And okay, so passions. Um, well, uh, if we hear some snoring today during the podcast, that is from my lovely little cavalier po. Uh, which is short for potato because that's what happens when you let your children name a pet. Um, And my other really big passion that I'm super into at the moment is crocheting. And I'm currently crocheting a dress that I aim to wear at the conference. That is amazing. And what a goal. And also I love children naming pets. And they so they would have been like, the dog kind of looks like a potato. Potato is a great name. Literally. So uh, my younger one wanted to name him Spite, S-P-I-T-E, Spite, um, because why not? And uh, my older one wanted to name him Chutney. Uh, What we both agreed on was Potato. So his full name is Potato Chutney Odoji. Okay. (laughs) That is hilarious. When you think about it, Spite is a pretty cool sounding word, but like... Mm. Probably doesn't have the connotations that you want for a cute doggo. Probs not. <laughs> yeah. Still cute. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about what what is a professional association. To get us started, I thought you could both elaborate a bit for listeners about what your current roles are in AAPI and what do you do in those roles. I don't. I don't mind going first. So, um, as the president of um, AAPI, so I have been a director on the board since 2019, um, and a lot of the association has changed completely um, since that time. We have added so many new member services, and just the way that the organisation has run um, has completely changed in the last sort of five years or so. Um, Part of our role is to contribute to the um, strategic planning and oversight of the main activities of AAPI. So things like um, what sort of partnerships should we collaborate on? What sort of advocacy should we be uh, prioritizing? Because obviously we're all, you know, really pushed for time and all of the board um, members and directors are all volunteering our time. And so we're wanting to make sure that we are really to the point um, and prioritizing what are the highest needs of the psychology profession that we represent. So they're kind of our main goals, I guess, as directors. Um, But we also do things like contribute to submissions and articles, media stuff, um, and a lot of other um, inter-organization representation. So we'll have meetings with all levels of government. um, And we'll also have meetings with other kinds of associations and organizations so that we know that the voices of psychologists who we represent will be put forward and considered. So that's how I see. our member organization as being run and led. Yeah. And Carly, do you do anything different or similar to what Sarah's describing? Yeah. Well, I've been on the board of directors for almost two years and excitingly, um, and also sadly in a way, but I'm not really going anywhere. I'm stepping down from that voluntary position to step into a policy coordinator position at the API, which is really exciting um, because what Sarah said is really comprehensive 
And I would just add that a lot of the work that we do within that strategic direction is to ensure that we are centering mental health and also the well-being of the psychology workforce in everything that we do. Like there's, there's really nothing, no decision, no topic of conversation that is ever had or made without those two things front and centre. Um, and so a bit of the work that I am enjoying and do is I, you know, look to the needs of what psychologists who are in API are wanting or talking about, what CPD they're interested in. And I'll go and talk to people who might be great in those fields and provide that as an offering for API. Um, and submissions like Sarah stated, I worked on the duty of um, care climate change bill with David Pocock and Amal, um, Anjali Sharma, which again, focus solely on mental health and the impacts for both Australians and psychologists working in this field. So yeah, it's, it's great. It's about relationship building. It's about really, again, focusing on psychology as a profession. How can we have a sustainable workforce? And why does psychology need a professional association anyway? Like, why can't we just trundle along and be all cool? And why do we need this big body where you do all these amazing things? This is such an important question, Bronwyn. So I think that unfortunately over the decades that psychology in Australia has existed, it has primarily been each individual solo practitioner or solo psychologist in a particular organisation um, doing the work that they love and being passionate about the support that they're providing to their clients. And because there has been such a limit in terms of connection with other psychologists and also a disconnection between what is happening on the ground with practitioners supporting the public uh, and what is happening in the decision-making upper echelons of politics and power, member associations uh, are here to bridge that gap. So we are wanting to listen to members, look at what the commonalities of issues um, are happening on the ground so that we can feed that back up to the people in power and the powers that be so that decisions can be made that are in the best interests of our members and the public who we serve. And then also vice versa, so that when there are big changes, so things like if there are opera changes or Medicare changes or those sorts of things, that we can reliably relay that information to people on the ground who are needing to implement those changes. So that's, I think, where the role of associations kind of fit. Carly, like, do you have anything to add? I do, and I love Sarah's response. I think um, the way I would see it as well is that the professional association that I am a member of, API, they supported me to um, feel and be valued because I guess, you know, what you speak about often is that um, psychologists are ripe to be exploited in the workplace, unfortunately. Um, and what I saw before I was a member versus when I was a member was that I felt like I was able to manage the risk of being exploited in workplaces um, or in the systems that would um, say that they valued mental health but weren't really walking the walk and funding it sustainably or effectively. So, yes, it was amazingly about connection. I've met so many beautiful psychologists that I never would have met without it. I love that. But it's also that, um, you know, how, like, who do I have? Like, what big body do I have to support me from not being exploited like in this career, because, you know, caring professions, like we do the most. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, particularly for our early career listeners, because the situation I'm imagining is that, well, this is what I had in my five plus one. It's like at our first lecture, we got a few pamphlets of professional organizations and they were like, join these associations, you get a discount and you get access to the DSM. And so that was like the main thing spouted. But I think it also professional associations play a huge role in kind of being that bigger body of knowledge. You know, when you're an early career psych, you don't know what you don't know kind of thing. And professional associations can help bridge that gap. I'm still learning. Yep. Even yeah. Even like, you know, you know seriously, um, there was like a question that came in to the API team and I was like, oh, that happens all the time. If there's a cancellation when you're a subcontractor, you don't get paid for it. And my colleague was like, what? That's still happening? And I was like, what? That was never meant to happen? You know, so... I, I think it really is about that sense of not having to do it alone, as Carly's saying. And I think particularly for early career psychologists, 
I never had that as an early career psychologist. So when I was a provisional 12, 13 years ago, that was um, never really on the table. So I didn't get the pamphlets to join particular organizations. We were aware that there was one organization that we could join at the time um, and that organization didn't actually allow me to join as a full member. I could only join as an associate member. And I thought, you know what, that's not kind of cool. Um, so I ended up working in disability services for a number of years um, and joined a disability services psychology association. Um, and I was a member of that for a couple of years. And that was primarily around CPD and networking opportunities uh, and those sorts of things. And I think that they've since been, um, they've now come under the umbrella of AAPI, which is really lovely. Um, and that was called Psych DD. Um, and really, there's a few small associations that still exist that are for really specific things. But what I think early career psychologists are looking for primarily is support. They want guidance. They want guidelines. They want um, help with managing issues. And I think that AAPI has just really kind of filled that gap in the market, really, for that. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe you both could tell us a bit more about what AAPI has achieved for its members. I know that's a big task because there's so much. <laughs> Um, where do I, where do we begin? <laughs> so I guess even in the small time that I've been a member or been a part of the team of the AAPI, um, membership has jumped up to almost a quarter of the psychology profession, which is really exciting for a like quite young organization, um, which again then speaks to how many people have found something worthwhile joining and remaining in the AAPI for. Recently also there was, there's been a lot of legal work to attain substantial equivalence for those who did um, that who didn't do clinical um, pathways to achieve substantial equivalence to get clinical registration which cannot be understated this was a lot of time effort and energy again perhaps I can speak more to it because I think she'd been in it longer than me but again really trying to eliminate that two-tier discrimination that is not evidence-based it's not helpful to people who are trying to see a psychologist and just get a rebate that is um, that helps them to afford being alive today. Yeah, there's there's a lot. The main the main thing that I have seen in my uh, I guess tenure at uh, AAPI has been the fact that AAPI and particularly psychologists who don't have clinical endorsement now have a seat at the table, and that really wasn't the case. You know, if you go back through like Senate estimates inquiries and parliamentary question times and all of those sorts of things when there have been topic topics of mental health and in particular Medicare or NDIS spoken about prior to 10 years ago, registered psychologists weren't even invited to speak. And now we are. Really? Wow. Absolutely. So it's, it's people like um, you know, the psychiatrists who tend to have a lot of airtime, so professors um, Hickey and Magari tend to represent. Um, there's been a lot of representation from other um, psychologist member organizations, um, but they all tend to be from a clinically endorsed background. Um, and so those of us without clinical endorsement or those of us with other kinds of endorsements haven't actually had a seat at the table. What AAPI, I believe, has been our biggest achievement has been advocating and pushing to have broader representation uh, with all, as I said before, all members of um, government, all levels of government, and at all different kinds of um, mental health um, representation. So again, Medicare reviews, Senate reviews, um, NDIS, open arms, victim services, all of these sorts of things, work cover. Previously, we weren't even um, given a seat. Now we're there. I think that's an amazing achievement. Like I wasn't aware that we weren't even included in like Senate estimates or even given a voice. And so I think that's amazing to have that seat at the table. Absolutely. And we have amazing representation with Tegan and Amanda, who represent the organization at so many of these um, places. I just add as well, not only do we get a seat at the table, but these organizations and like um, government representatives will actually contact us to seek our involvement 
which is incredible when you hear Sarah describe, you know, what the position or of them was 10 years ago. And with that seat at the table and being invited to make submissions and that really being included, it seems like AAPI really helps to make change in the areas that are important for the psychology workforce. Absolutely. So one of the things just recently that comes to my mind is the telehealth sessions being included ongoing. So we made huge submissions and recommendations for telehealth sessions to continue post-COVID lockdowns. Um, And because of our submissions, they were included. Uh, We're also really working hard uh, with things like pushing up the Medicare rebate. So in, you know, the however many years of us being uh, registered, um, the Medicare rebate had gone up, I think, literally like $5 um, in that time. But in the last two years, there have been something like three increases. So that in itself shows that even though it's, you know, a $1 here, $1 there, they are listening and it's incremental change that we're working with because we know that governments and budgets are set well in stone before we even come into the room, but we know that there is scope for change and that they are listening. Yeah. And I I guess I just want to highlight that these changes are not ins- insignificant. Like even the telehealth change, it's like prior to it being made permanent for as as long as we hope for. Um, but prior to that, it was that you could only get a Medicare rebate if you were in a remote and regional area. So like the Monash areas and you had to be a particular amount of distance away from your psychologist as well, which like on the face of it, it's like that excludes folks who are living with disabilities who can't attend sessions face to face. Or what about people who are say parents and don't have other people available for child caring. Um, so it excluded a whole bunch of folks or people who live in different states who need a particular type of therapy and that's only available interstate. So um, it's a huge, huge change that will increase accessibility for for millions of people. That's it. And I think um, when you come back to like the APIs, like some of the main tenants that they fight for, it is access and it is affordability because not only does that make it easier for people who are going through psychological distress to get the support that they need when they need it Um, but also again for that sustainable workforce to deliver that work. So we've got these far-reaching benefits that people can have from joining a professional association. I just wondered were there any other resources that might be particularly relevant to early career psychologists that they could get from joining a professional association because I think there might be a concept uh, maybe like a misconception that joining a professional association offers really limited benefits and perks beyond networking. I went nuts when I was a prof psych on all the templates and resources. I was like, oh, okay, this is like a Wikipedia for psychologists and just everything that like I could adapt to my own private practice that I run. It was just perfect because I was getting confused looking online, asking different people because they'd send me different information or I'd be like, I know that this is missing from this. I don't want to run the risk of missing anything or being, you know, unethical, not intentionally, but just from not having all my bases covered. The resource library is you get lost in it. So that I found really helpful because I guess like I have that paranoia of ever being um, pinged with opera and I was like, well, I've got this. So on that face, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, it does provide a level of reassurance. Um, Sarah, anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I love the the policy and the guidelines sections. That really totally, as Carly said, makes me feel really secure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing everything, you know, above board and everything yeah. has been approved and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like you don't have to come up with your own cancellation policy because there's one right there. The other thing that I find hugely valuable is the responsiveness of our member queries um, and member questions line. I mean, I've used it as as someone working in private practice. My team has used it. And I've also been on the other end of it where I've been supporting people to um, uh, when they've come to us asking questions. And I think the fact that we are so responsive, basically every query that comes through gets answered within the same day or at most the next day. Um, I don't know any other organization that would be as responsive. Um, And I know that a lot of people wouldn't be calling if it wasn't, I need help right now because I'm panicking and I feel like this is super urgent. 
No, I agree. And that's something that I've heard feedback from on social media that people really appreciate about about AAPI, its responsiveness, um, because they've been to other associations and they've been really panicked and they haven't received that. And it can feel really, I guess, disappointing, like when you're really in your time of need and you're not getting that responsiveness. Yeah. I think I'd also, what I really enjoyed as well is like the various um, interest groups, like just connecting with other psychologists who I might not have ever met before organically or might have taken a really long time to talk about practice and to meet regularly and to discuss how we're using these various offshoots in practicing because you have to. You know, I love eco-psychology. I also love yoga. And, you know, you actually have to meet with others like peers and talk about it so they can kind of oversee or practice and mitigate risk again. Because if opera are like, what are you doing with this person? You can say, well, I've been, I've been, you know, looking at the evidence of my peers. It actually, it's well researched. Yes. No, that's a huge benefit as well. Um, Carly and Sarah, I just want to go through some potential misconceptions that people might have about professional associations. Is that okay? For sure. So pretty much I'm going to just say a statement and then I'm going to be like, agree, disagree kind of thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so statement one. Professional organizations are only by invite only and they are exclusive. So if you're at a lower stage of your career, you can't join or they're inaccessible. So they're very expensive and that makes them exclusive as well. That was a long statement, but have a go. Hell's no. Agree and it's a great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Carly first. I'm- Sorry, okay. I'm only saying I'm only saying hell's no because of my my relationship with AAPI. But <laughs> I'd love to hear Carly. <laughs> no, same. I disagree because of my experience with AAPI, but I disagree because of different associations I've tried or considered joining that actually weren't inclusive. For sure. And like I said before, you know, the fact that I was only able to become an associate member yes. of a particular organization. To me, you're already seen as being like on the periphery. You're not even a core member. Whereas with AAPI, we don't have membership statuses based on where you are in your career or what your your specialization is. It's basically just if you are a student, cool, that's one price point and it's super affordable. I think it's like 50 bucks a year. And then once you're fully registered, it's whether you work part-time or full-time. So again, it's based on how much you're willing to pay and so how much you can afford. And that is, again, coming back to our core value, as Carly was saying, of affordability. Totally. Okay, next thing. So some people may argue that professional associations are influenced by commercial interests like sponsorship deals or partnerships, which could potentially compromise their independence and objectivity. Is this true? I mean, potentially. So AAPI disagree? Yeah, for AAPI disagree. Mm. Okay, but potentially. Let us know, Sarah. What are you thinking? I mean, I've met with other CEOs and presidents of other boards and associations, and not just psychologists, but other associations that are out there. And sure, they might be influenced by commercial interests. But again, I feel like, and you know, this is bang on what Carly said, Because we were and started off as being such a grassroots organization and we're a member first, member led organization, we started with the members and then we kind of went, hmm, what kind of benefits and partnerships do our members want? Let's see if we can bring them on board. Um, So I'm really not sure about, you know, what kinds of um, other partnership um, or money led interests. Um, there might be that are out there but all I know is that's kind of not how we work yeah and I guess a way that maybe members or people considering joining a professional association could check that out is by seeing how transparent the organization is right like with their financial dealings and I guess what their objectives are and how they're reaching them for sure and also if you're curious ask you know, because I think like a lot of um, organization information is pretty confusing if you haven't had any like significant financial right. training, you know. So, I mean, if you want to understand like who the organization is partnered with, what that looks like, if there are any conflicts, you can ask, you know. And I guess what I would say is that 
if you're if a organization is not happy to answer those questions and that perhaps might give you a bit of information about how they run that's a really good point carly okay Next thing is that some people may say, look, all professional associations are the same in their profession. Like they don't really offer anything different. They're pretty much identical in benefits and services. Is this true? No. And I would say that um, there are different organizations who might have a different suite of offerings or who might have reduced offerings. Um, And that's just, again, not psychology focused, but others. But I think as well, you know, not everyone needs to join an organization or wants to, but it depends what you would like to get out of your career, what support you'd like to have. And maybe then the decision making can be influenced by that kind of inquiry. Yeah. To add to that, I think, yes, there are a lot of similarities between healthcare professional organizations and representative bodies. Um, You know, we all do things like CPD. We all do things like networking events. Um, insurance discounts, those sorts of things. I think that there are quite a lot of things that you have in common. The couple of things that I would encourage everyone to look at, and I think, again, this is a difference between what is happening on the ground level and what is happening in the, I guess, upper echelons of an organization or how the organization chooses to operate, is look at how your money is being spent. Look at what the organization that you're thinking about joining, what are they doing in terms of their political sway? What are they doing in terms of their advocacy issues? Um, In my psychology practice and in my life and in my role with AAPI, I'm a very values-led person. So the first thing that resonated with me when joining AAPI was the transparency transparency. And follow through the action that came from the values of AAPI. And I think that when we look at all of the the actions that AAPI has taken and the fact that they are all really values aligned, they are working to serve psychologists, they are working to serve the patients and clients of psychologists. That to me is about basically seeing how your dollars are being spent. So yes, there's value for money, but also it's not just about what am I getting out of that membership relationship. It's also about what am I contributing to the profession? And I think that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to maybe look at it in terms of what can I gain from it, but it's also Mm. about what can I contribute to it. That's a really good way of looking at it, Sarah. I think it's about, you know, really looking at the bigger picture. Um, And again, We're really now shifting from every psychologist in their own little silo operating by ourselves into looking at what is psychology like as a profession and where are we shifting our profession um, through things like political sway and advocacy. Yeah, this ties in nicely to something that I wanted to go on with, which is just some potentially taboo or uncomfortable things about this topic. And that is that I wondered what you both thought that there may be some judgment from colleagues about your association with particular organisations, particularly if those organisations, their policies or positions don't align with their own values and beliefs about where the profession should be heading. And I just wondered whether you could speak to maybe like maybe have you received any negative judgment or is that not not based in reality and and how might members manage that I've never experienced anything to my faith um it's not to say it hasn't ever happened but I think also um from those around me and those who I work with I think they come to expect a certain kind of set of behaviors or choices from me that um, are aligned with what I believe in which is like equity justice um so I don't think many people would be shocked that I have joined and remain like very like, you know, AAPI happy. However, I can definitely imagine many, many situations in which that experience is not another person. And I think there's a lot of historical um, beliefs and perhaps values from some subsections of the medical establishment or within the psychology profession that is also continued and perpetuated by just the two-tier, non-evidence-based discrimination, I could definitely see how that could occur. 
in environments where that is a big part. And yeah, that would be very difficult. And I think your response would be very like temperament, confidence, personality based. Um, yeah. But I think if you kind of if step away from all the noise, what matters to you? You know, do you have people around you? Do you have a community who you can turn to and just talk about this stuff when it happens? Um, yeah, what is a meaningful career and life to you? I know that's a bit like kumbaya, but yeah. yeah. No, cool. Sarah? Unfortunately, there has been a lot of factiousness in the psychology profession. I think that all the different sorts of factions will have, you know, their own stances and um, I'm going to say ideologies um, that might guide the way that they practice and might guide the way that they operate. I mean, I think, again, AAPI is very transparent in our ideology and in our values and stances and the way that we operate. Um, in terms of things like negative pushback, um, again, I don't think I've personally received anything to my face. There's definitely been a lot of online stuff that gets spewed about um different organizations and unfortunately I think that you know that's going to keep happening when everyone is sort of you know stuck in their own little bubble and not necessarily wanting to come out and engage with um, other members of their professional community. My stance is always that I'm always open for a chat. I'm always wanting to, you know, promote the great things that AAPI are doing. But also I totally respect anybody's decision to either not be a member or to join a different organization. I think that everyone essentially just has to make the right kinds of decisions for them. One thing that I again will say is, you know, when you are doing things like, um, finding the CPD, for instance, that is right for you, um, or if you are downloading and purchasing resources, if you're engaging in supervision, if you're engaging in business coaching, check to see who you are purchasing from because I'm very much of the opinion that we need to be conscious spenders and we need to be aware of where our dollars are going and if we are purchasing things that might uh, perhaps go go against our values or our uh, ideologies, um, then this is definitely something that we can make conscious decisions about. Um, you know, so for instance, it's the same principle that we might have when we're choosing, let's say, a super fund. Uh, if we're choosing a super fund that is, you know, contributing to really bad climate change activities and investing in mining stuff, I definitely would, you know, divest from that and go with something that I believed was more ethical. And I think we have to do that with any kind of purchase we make, especially when we're talking about our mandated 30 hours of CPD every year. Totally. Thank you, Sarah. And I just have a, I'm not really sure how to frame this, but I'll give it a good shot. But maybe it's about managing expectations. So members may not always agree with what their professional association is doing. So for instance, some people may really agree with the dismantling of the two-tier system, but just have a disagreement with their organization in another area. And I just wanted to ask you both, like, what are your expectations of the relationship, I guess, that members should have with these organizations? And are they going to agree with everything? And if they don't agree with everything, then should they cancel their membership? I love this question so much. I don't think um, I'll agree with everything that AAP does, API does, sorry, um, in the entire time that I'm connected, both as someone who is on the team and as a member myself. And that's okay. I guess it really depends on um, the nature of the conversation around the disagreement, like how respected and heard do I feel? And, you know, what, what are the mechanisms I can use to at least have my feedback raised and feel like I've been heard? It, again, really depends on what the organization does, but I think that disagreements are part of life and, you know, they're part of work, they're part of any kind of relationship. And I think that to expect a member org to do everything perfectly is maybe setting it up for failure or setting yourself um, up for failure in that relationship. Um, I'm not um, signposting that we're just going to start being worried, not at all. We are still very much <laughs> led by members. 
you know, but I think, um, again, manage your expectations. If there is something that you do disagree with, like what can you do about it? How can you like get that um, across? Yeah. Sarah? Yeah, I think that, you know, in my time with the board, personally, there have been a number of things that I've disagreed with. But we are, again, a member-led organization. We're also a really democratic board. And so if I feel as though I've put my side forward and I've been given a chance to speak and I've been heard and listened to, I'm also going to respect the fact that we as an organization making a decision kind of trumps my individual personal opinion, particularly on some matters. I will also say that as a member organization, um, there is a bit of a tension and there can be a bit of a push and pull between making sure that the members' voices are not just being heard but are being acted on while also sometimes being hamstrung with government policies, opera stuff, the kinds of bigger systemic things that we as an organization have to operate within. And Often there are going to be times when we have to balance, you know, what can we do to support our members versus what do we actually have scope to do given the constraints that might be operating around us and the context that we operate within. So I think there are a lot of um, expectations um, where, you know, we're going to make a radical change and an organization is going to make a radical change based on um, some feedback from members when unfortunately that might not actually be possible because of those bigger picture systemic issues that we are constrained by. Yeah, no, and I was also thinking that um, with change, it can take a really long time and I understand that some people may feel frustrated with how long changes take. From my from my perspective, it, it's just the reality of of how of how long these things take and how each step can be significant and take like twelve months to achieve or longer. Um, but it's an important step. So I guess like maybe I just echo what both of you say that if as a member you do feel that you don't understand or you're frustrated or that you've got a different perspective. I, I think professional associations should be willing to engage with you and be like, yeah, here's what we're trying to achieve and this is why it takes so long and here's how it's important. Do you think? Absolutely. And I think that a really great example of that is a lot of the legal wins that AAPI has made over the last four or five years. We had a really big member push a few years ago to raise money, grassroots money, for essentially what we call the Legal Fighting Fund. And what that meant was we were able to retain lawyers, to put forward cases, to do test cases. And I think that, you know, I'm I'm a psychologist. I'm not a lawyer. I don't have a really good understanding of things like court processes and how long a lot of these sorts of things take, particularly over COVID when everything got delayed. And I absolutely hear members' frustration over, you know, asking questions. Okay, so why haven't we heard back about the outcome of XYZ case? And I think it's important to recognize that we don't know what we don't know. We don't know how long these sorts of things take and that whenever we do get information whenever we have an outcome or often when we have a partial outcome, we will put that information out to members literally the same day. And again, that responsiveness in feedback is something that is hugely unique to AAPI. And so understanding that, yes, we're all sitting in frustration when we're looking for things like the outcomes to legal challenges or other kinds of challenges, but that there's always going to be things that are going to be fed back to us when the time is right. So I think sometimes we just have to know what we don't know. Yeah. No, thank you, Sarah. Okay. I want to bring a bit of hope back into this episode. And I wanted to ask you, what do you see advocacy and psychology achieving in the next five years or AAPI achieving? And and dream big. And two to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dream big. And two tier. Okay. And, yep. And two tier. That's that's yeah. my hope. What yeah. about you, Carly? Yeah, exactly the same. I think the substantial equivalence win is massive. And I think 
about all the amazing, talented, caring, kind professionals um, who are, you know, five plus one or four plus two um, students, graduates who would, you know, love to be able to bulk bill, you know, especially in the context of cost of living crisis. That doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. And yeah, just how that would change things for so, so many Australians. Psychologists are not Australians. Um, can't be understated. So that is my big dream. Anything else you both wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, ideally I'd be able to really work on climate policy with the government and like, you know, support yeah, cool. psychs and, you know, non-psychs through what that would all look like over the next coming decades. That would be my dream. I would absolutely support you in that, Carly. It would Thank be you. hugely. It already is important, um, but it will continue to be such a, an important area that psychologists need to be skilled up in um, in the future. Mm. I think a lot of the the things that I am really, really hopeful for and the things I think that we are basically on the cusp of achieving are things like being able to roll out appropriate and the necessary length of services for our clients. I think that the halving of the Medicare sessions, um, you know, a year ago just meant that a lot of people were suffering. We need to have that Medicare rebate rates raised to the 150 um, because, as Carly's saying, I think a lot of us are really wanting to bulk bill. We want to be able to help more, and it's just it's just not possible currently. And so, our advocacy is really about that broader systemic change. We need to make sure that the government understands that what they are doing is affecting people on the ground, um, and mm. we are wanting to support. Our members who are providing the services so that we could help more of the Australian population. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, just to echo both of you, like, yeah, my big dream is to have accessible and adequate mental health care for everybody in Australia. And it's it's crazy that we don't have that. And I do see the dismantling of the two-tier system as crucial to increasing accessibility and adequacy of mental health services because like you know you're both psychs I'm a psych too and it's like with the halving of the Medicare sessions nobody would ever say to a person with cancer like mm. here's your half dose of chemotherapy like it'd be disgusting and it, and for me I just feel like it's similarly disgusting for mental health people deserve better Oh, yeah, my God. And isn't it sad? Like, I know you were trying to end on a hopeful note, but isn't it sad? Yeah, no. Like, <laughs> how your big dream is like, I just want adequate health care for me. I know. I know. I just want I people know. to have the right amount of treatment that they deserve. Yeah. Like, I know. You know, there shouldn't be such a big ask. No. No. Yeah. Literally. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I've got two more questions. Um, what small steps can early career psychs take to make positive changes in their profession right now? And I guess like the, the cough there is like joint AAPI. <laughs> I mean, I definitely think so. I would very much encourage anyone, if they're not yet ready to join, come and chat to us, chat to members, um, call us, talk to us about what we offer, um, have a look at our website, have a look at all of the great things that we can do to support you. I also think, and I'm going to keep pushing the money angle here, I really want people to be a lot more conscious about what they are spending their money on and why they are choosing to give their money to particular um, companies or organizations rather than others. I think that being able to be a conscious spender and knowing where your money is going and what you are funding no. is so important. So definitely have a look at that. Totally. And I believe that AAPI has some vacant board positions or it wants like more diversity on its board. Um, so like ed dev sites, community sites, provisional sites, indigenous sites, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. BIPOC sites, LGBTQI sites, neurodiverse affirming sites. We want to have a really broad and representative board so that we can, we can encourage a really broad and representative membership. Absolutely. So if anyone yeah, is listening to this and is keen, like do get in touch with AAPI. And finally, could you tell us what AAPI has coming up? Our conference. Yeah. <laughs> so just to give out the dates to listeners, the date of the conference is the 20th to the 22nd of March, 2024. It's in Brisbane. Tickets are currently available. There's a jam-packed program. I'm really looking forward to, I've signed up to the workshops on the Wednesday. So I'm doing 
I, I can't remember the exact title, but it's like how to work well with Indigenous folk um, and being culturally responsive in your practice. And then I'm doing a workshop on neurodiversity affirming practice and how to assess um, neurodiversity in those affirming frameworks. Brilliant. Yes. I'm excited for everything, honestly. I think I'm going to like take like three notebooks and I'll just be like scribbling away, trying to like brain dump everything. But yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. there any sessions you're looking forward in particular? 100% Dr. Tracy Westerman. I've been following her oh my work God. since before I was a PP. And yeah, I, you know, if we think of like psychology and our prostating, that psychology is going to be decolonized. Well, who better to hear from than an Indigenous psychologist who does so much? to support Absolutely. other Indigenous psychologists. Um, everyone, honestly, yeah. I'm, I'm, so keen to, I'm so keen to hear about the different um, professions and pathways in psychology. Like I'm really keen to hear from Hunter Mulcair about being a health psychologist. I'm really keen to hear, of course, Tracy Westman, that goes without saying. But I think being able to just pick and choose all of the different areas, like we've got a neurodiversity specialization, a massive, great big panel. Um, we're speaking on the last day, looking at the future of psychology. Um, you know, we've got some really great, I think it ticks the boxes for literally anybody. Like you'll find something that you like. Um, and there'll be such great networking events. You know, the, there's a financial literacy and accountancy um, lunchtime symposium with Dream Accounting, who are phenomenal. And I can't wait to be a part of that as well. And I think that, again, you know, I'm a psychologist, I'm not an accountant, but having financial literacy as a business owner and working in a private practice, I think is such an important thing. So yeah, so many things that will suit everybody. Yeah. And it was member driven, the topics of the conference. So there was a survey put out and then members put in their topics. And I had a look at all those topics and everyone like here in this panel did as well. And I was like, okay, how can we do this? How can we make this need? Yes. And I'm bringing my whole team up from Sydney for Amazing. the conference. And basically what we're doing is we're like dividing and conquering on the <laughs> first day for the workshops. So some of us are going to some and some of us are going to the other and then we're going to swap these our notes because, yeah, it's just going to be so much stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to meeting everybody. I want to come back to Tracy Westerman because she lives in Perth um, and she loves running. And so literally like Tracy Westerman is sometimes my motivation to get outside because I'm like, because uh, she runs like around Perth and I live around Perth and I'm like, maybe I run into Tracy Westerman. I'll keep on running. <laughs> what so a good. wonderful motivation. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I could meet Tracy Westerman today. She won't want to speak to me because she's like interested in her running and that would be weird and creepy, but maybe I could get a look. We could see her, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to her speaking is the neurodivergent way of saying that. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so many great opportunities. There's so mm -hmm. many great people coming. I was I was just actually talking with Tess Crawley. Tess Crawley will be um, presenting as well. Um, she's excited to be there. Yeah, there's just amazing people who are coming down for it or coming up for it, which is great. Yeah, awesome. Well, Thank you so much, Carly and Sarah, for coming on this episode. It's been so informative to have you talk about what a professional organisation is and the role that it can play in people's lives who are psychologists and how it can really have far-reaching impacts. And so thank you so much for your time and expertise. Thanks so much, Bronwyn, for having us. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. And listeners, thank you so much for listening. This episode was sponsored by the Australian Association of Psychologists. So thank you for them for sponsoring the podcast. If you're loving the show and don't want to miss an episode, please press follow on your podcast listening app. And if there's somebody you know who you think might be interested in this episode, do chuck it into their ears and show them how to listen to it. And that's a wrap. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a good one and catch you next time. Bye.